Thank you, Graham, and uh, thank you, Nils. Now it's time for our first uh, Q&A session, a uh, relatively short one. Uh, there will be two uh, ways to conduct this for you here in the room. Uh, there will be a microphone, and please uh, state your company and your name. And then on uh, the live stream, uh, there will be the opportunity to go into the slido.com app, uh, and there you either can use the CR code or you can uh, use the code here, which is uh, 894003, where you can direct your question and we'll take care of those. So I will uh, leave the word for anybody here in the room, any questions uh, you might have at this uh, early stage. And I will say there will be ample of opportunity uh, also later on by the end, uh, where we will have a good time for all questions you might have. So, doesn't seem as there is any questions here in the room. Yes, we have one here. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard Garstang from Oldfield Partners. Um, I just wondered if you could actually expand a little bit on some of the comments you made around new categories and be able to expand into new things. Um, what does that sort of mean? A bit more sort of detail on that would be great. Thank you. I think that's what for you, Nils. Thank you for that question. I think what we have said over the years is that cigars is our core business and where we will put most of our effort and most of our money. But we are also seeing that with the uh, development that is taking place in the wider tobacco categories, there are all sorts of new opportunities emerging. And on the one hand, we have the view that we should not be competing head to head with big tobacco. On the other hand, we are also convinced that there's going to emerge opportunities where we can meaningfully play and win. And these will typically be se you know, niche segments where uh, there's a higher component of an enjoyment, typically a little bit of an older consumer profile, and that's what we're looking for. We also think it's naive to think that we can you know, live off cigars alone. We think we need to supplement it with some of these other categories, and we think we haven't seen, let's call it, the last invention in that area yet. Okay. Thank you, Nils. I hope that uh, answered your question, Richard. Perfect. So, anyone else here in the room for a question? Otherwise, uh, yes, there's one here, Jerry. Jerry Gallagher of, Do <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Jerry Gallagher of Deutsche Bank. Just following up on that, Nils, could you maybe talk a little bit about whether you're thinking about these new categories from an organic perspective <coughs> or an M&A perspective? <coughs> and then following on to that, just the general M&A question, uh, you've done a couple of you know, very powerful deals in terms of return on invested capital, probably from day one, maybe not as many as you would have wanted to do. Could you just talk a little bit about how the landscape for m &A sits today, perhaps compared to where it has done over the last few years? Thanks. Yes. So if we start first around the new categories, I think that you know, we've said before, and I'm happy to say again, we are not going out and investing a lot of money in this. So we are going to explore these categories. We're going to start experimenting. And the best example is really our Versa hip product in the US. We're talking about a test launch in three to five states in the US on smokable hemp. The non-intoxicating part of the cannabis plant, we think there is a niche market for consumers that wants to smoke a non-nicotine product with a nice smoking experience. It's sold at a relatively high price. We think that's a way of testing, you know, can we be in that particular segment? Now, could there emerge uh, acquisition opportunities over time? I think the answer is yes. But I'm also uh, thinking that we would want some level of evidence before we would put a significant amount of money behind that. It is not an area where we uh, are going to be, let's say, overly bold. So we are, you know, we are taking a cautious approach to it, but we think we need to build some of these new income streams in new areas as well. If you look at the general M&A landscape, um, uh, I think the best way to describe it is that the industry is not bigger than we are in contact with everyone. 
So if there's anyone who is looking to divest their business, they will know that we have an interest. But this also does not mean that we can automatically uh, know, generate more acquisitions faster because it's really different things that end up triggering versus uh, different divestments. Sometimes it is you know, a new generation having to decide whether to step into the business or not. Sometimes it's new legislation. Um, and sometimes it's just you know, people not liking the risk profile of the business. What I can say is that we do believe that with the acquisitions we have made and with the progress we are making in the earnings of the company, we have moved ourselves to a new level of capacity so we can actually uh, afford more acquisitions today based on basically being in better control of the business, making more money. Um, 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 so from that perspective, we, are, we believe we are in a better position or we are more ready than we've ever been for acquisitions. Okay, thank you for that, Nils. Um, and I'm just looking out here. And then I can see we do have a question from, um, from Nicholas Ekman at uh, Carnegie. Uh, you mentioned that regulation has created an opportunity for M&A. Can you give some examples of, uh, of this? And has the M&A activity in the industry increased since uh, Tobacco Products Directive in Europe and uh, FDA uh, deeming regulation? Um, I think that if you look at, um, at the Arjo transaction, uh, I think that transaction is a good example of multiple factors being in play. It's seldom it's one particular thing. But so for, for Arjo, it was really a combination of um, the risk profile of the industry versus the alternative use of money inside their own company. They had over the years built a secondary investment vehicle into industrial products and they wanted to take some more money from the tobacco business and move it into the, um, uh, into the in industrial part and they were feeling increasingly uncomfortable with the risk profile of tobacco. And this was especially related to a few big markets where they have a big exposure. If you go a few years further back, we did buy a Belgian company called Ferellen back in 2014. And there the owners basically said, you know, we are not going to implement TBD2. We don't really want to bother, so we'll sell the business. So it's a number of different things. Um, but we are, we are somewhat surprised that we've not seen more M&A opportunities come up from new regulation. But we are hoping that they will come in the future. Okay, thank you, Nils. Uh, then we have uh, another one uh, from the live stream uh, from Anonymous. Uh, you mentioned uh, supply chain issues, and I think this is for you, Graham, uh, in your recent results calls being dealt with by the first quarter of next year. Is that still the case? So I think, uh, thank you for the question. And I think with this audience, I want to be really specific. You know, we have supply issues, but into Europe. And they're driven really by three key things. One was a shortage of summer seasonal labor availability at the end of summer. That's solved. The factories are fully crewed. The second one was a delay in shipments coming out of China and some of our key packaging materials. We've built extra inventory to cover that volatility. And again, that issue is solved. The third thing that we spoke about in the results call was a slower than expected, expected ramp up of machines. Again, that issue is solved. And now we have plans in place to supply the full volume into the market and clear the issue, worst case through quarter one. And we remain aligned to the guidance that we recently communicated. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Graham. And then we have a question from uh, Søren. Given the ERP implementation, would you be willing to do large-scale M&A right now? And in, in what areas, uh, geographies and products? So I think that's for you, Nils. Yes, so obviously we are very occupied with planning as well as we can for the SAP implementation. But we also have the fundamental view that we cannot control when the big opportunities arise and we basically have to manage our way through a situation. Again, we always remind people that just because we buy a company, 
it doesn't mean we automatically need to integrate it on day one. We have flexibility on how we can organize that, and we would certainly not want to let a attractive M&A opportunity pass because of the SAP implementation. So that's our, our, our let's say, our view on the issue of uh, priorities. When it comes to where would we prefer to see the next last transaction, and here I would say that if we had to choose, we would rather do more in the handmade area right now, and especially things in the handmade area that would, be, that would support further globalization. But we will take any type of transaction that we believe is right for the business long term, but that's probably where we would prefer it if we could choose it ourselves. Okay, thank you. And I see still uh, questions coming in from the, the live stream, uh, but uh, any more here from, uh, from the room? Otherwise, we'll take another one from the live stream. And um, that is watching the videos. There's a great luxury goods category pitch here. So how can you best promote awareness uh, to this? Anything beyond store rollout. So maybe also for you, Nils. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, handmade cigars is a luxury category, luxury category, but it's also a category for everyone. So the U.S. is a, it's two-thirds of global consumption of handmade cigars, and it's a category consumed, you know, from $3 up to more than $100. So, so luxury is certainly an element of this category, and we do everything we can to premiumize the handmade uh, cigar category. And it's very appropriate that we brought along with us today Sean Williams, who is our Cohiba brand ambassador, and he'll be happy to talk to you about some of the latest initiatives we've done, which is basically placing more, you know, $250 uh, per, you know, cigar products out there and selling them. So we are doing as much as we can to premiumize, but, but it's also important to remember that it's people from all types of life that smoke handmade cigars. And it's something that actually brings people together across income barriers or borders. Thank you. And I think with those uh, words, uh, we will uh, conclude uh, this Q&A session for now. Again, there will be plenty of opportunities later on uh, during the day for, for more questions. Now we'll take a relatively short uh, coffee break, uh, bone stretcher, whatever that is required, and we will be back here a quarter to three. So thank you. <laughs>